All right. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here and to talk to you a little bit about resilience. Um, these are my disclosures. And I was also asked to talk a little bit about um, my team and kind of where I come from. And it was, as was mentioned, I'm a psychologist. I work at the Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center along with a physician, another psychologist, and two neuroscientists. But that doesn't get at half of our team. Our team is many physicians, surgeons, nurses, OTs, PTs. Um, we even have medical assistants delivering our uh, interventions. Uh, we have engineers, we have um, imaging people. It, it just kind of uh, pays to speak to everybody that you can and tell them about your interests in research. And it's amazing who knows somebody else who has that same interest and you start to make these, these webs. Um, but within our team, I'm kind of the uh, kind of the E for emotions, so I really focus on uh, emotions and pain. And um, as psychologists, we've done a dandy job looking at depression and anxiety and all these other um, negative emotions, um, anger, helplessness, pessimism. These are all important things, and, and yes, we we study them, and and we do know that they're highly associated with everything that we don't want to see in our pain outcomes, such as uh, hyperalgesia, um, greater use of pain medication worse analgesia, longer hospital stays, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to think about these things. And, and uh, back in 2009, IP and colleagues did a really nice uh, systematic review of numbers of studies looking at a particular predictive factor for post-operative pain. And they found anxiety and psychological distress to be way at the forefront of what might be predicting these poor outcomes. And the psychological factors were also very uh, well studied and really um, likely to be predictive of post-operative analgesic consumption. So these are important factors, as is pain catastrophizing. If you've not heard of this term, it, it refers to kind of this anxious pessimism about your ability to control pain or, or you're just anticipating the worst possible outcome can, can, would occur. And this pain catastrophizing is associated with uh, pain following breast cancer surgery and elective surgery as well as lumbar fusion and ENT. It's even associated with pain um, following post um, uh, knee arthroplasty immediately, but also at two years. So these are really powerful um, constructs to consider. Uh, in a meta-analysis of 29 studies looking at anxiety and pain catastrophizing, uh, pretty much across the board, uh, these two factors were associated with post-chronic um, chronic post-surgical pain. And in about 67% of the studies in musculoskeletal surgery, these factors were highly predictive of poor outcomes, and pain catastrophizing might even be one of the best. So these are important factors, and, and we don't want to poo-poo them, but we as human beings are much, much more than negative factors. We're much, much more than depression and anxiety. We have um, the ability to be quite resilient, and that's what I study. So I study kind of the opposite end of the coin, and I'm interested in crazy things like happiness and love and calm and enthusiasm. My other psychologists kind of shun me sometimes, but it's okay. These are really interesting and important topics to look at. These are because the science is behind them. When we look at positive affect in a series of studies looking at perspective and experimental outcomes, positive emotions, positive affective, affective states are, um, are highly, highly predictive of all the outcomes we do want to see, including lower levels of pain medication, uh, less post-operative pain, greater, uh, post, um, walk, greater times walking, uh, post-surgery, and length of stay um, reduction. And even emotions, really intense emotions like laughter, have really strong physiological effects. In this study here looking at uh, Duchenne laughter, which is laughter that comes from your gut. You know, we have kind of the ha ha ha, I'm laughing because I'm polite. And other times we just like think we might pass out because we're laughing so hard. That's Duchenne laughter, that's from the gut. That has really strong physiological and biological correlates. There might even be kind of an endorphin mediated opioid effect when we laugh that hard. So that has been shown to be associated with greater pain um, thresholds. So you might ask me, what underlies the magic? What, what is it with positive emotions? You know, what do we understand about these things, and, and how might they be really useful? So probably the best theory looking at positive emotions um, came from Barbara Fredrickson when she was at the University of Michigan before she moved. And uh, she came up with the broaden and build theory. And what she proposed was that experiences of positive emotions broaden people's momentary thought action repertoires. It just gives us more options. 
This in turn serves to build enduring personal resources, ranging from physical intellectual resources to social and psychological resources. So what she's saying is that negative emotions serve really important survival functions. Fear and anxiety makes us tighten our focus, right? So when we're anxious and we're focused, we're seeing that tiger in the weeds, right? But positive emotions, and on experimental studies, show us that we actually lift up and are, are, we have a broader view. You can actually see more in your periphery when you have positive emotions on board. So positive emotions just kind of broaden our options for thought and action. It makes our thought more creative and flexible and integrative. The positive emotions also undo the lingering effects of negative emotions because we are combinations of both types of emotions. And the types of effects that positive emotions undo are kind of the negative physiological effects often that come with negative emotions. And positive emotions can help us build resiliency for later. When we're positive, we tend to bounce back because adversity does happen. Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people and we need to be able to bounce back. And also positive emotions draw people to us. When you're smiling, when you're laughing, when you're warm, when you're kind, people come to you and that becomes your social support and that's one of the best forms of resilience that we can develop. So positive emotions are associated with all the outcomes we hope to achieve. Um, they, we can build resilience, though, possibly in our surgical patients by putting in some of these principles in our perioperative uh, peri settings. So how do we do this? So one notion is prehabilitation. And this is the idea that engaging surgical patients in activities that better prepare them for surgery, including physical therapy, activities such as walking, um, improving sleep, nutrition, uh, breathing exercises, relaxation, all of these before surgery can help decrease anxiety and pain catastrophizing. Remember, those are the predictors of bad stuff. What we have at the University of Michigan is a really lovely, scalable online program called MSHOP, which stands for the Michigan Surgical Health and Optimization Program. And what we tell the patients is like athletes training for an event, surgical patients can train for surgery. And the patients who enroll in this program are um, encouraged to stop smoking. They're encouraged to eat better, to sleep better, uh, to exercise a little bit more, to relax, um, and to even do some PT, kind of pre-PT um, exercises and practice on the inspirometers. So our patients go in more prepared for surgery, the surgical process, but also psychologically, having a sense that they have some mastery or some say or an ability within surgery. And uh, Drs. Englesby and his team has shown about a 31% reduction in duration of stay in patients who undergo the MSHOP program and about 28% lower total costs. These are self-directed programs predominantly for, for patients. So resilience that is kind of beyond prehabilitation is actually even more accessible. We call these kind of positive activities or positive activity interventions. These little gems don't require a lot of specialized training. You don't need psychologists to deliver them. Uh, they can be provided just by any healthcare work workers or provided online. Uh, they don't really need a fancy delivery system. They can be on pieces of paper. That's how we frequently do this. And what we have learned as psychologists, and I think maybe just observers of humanity, that people do what's fun, right? You got a whole list of things that you got to do on a Sunday afternoon. What's the first thing you do? Probably the fun thing, <laughs> right? It's just human nature. We do what's fun. So positive activity interventions are all many, many things. This is just a list of the most um, interventions with the most evidence um, behind them. And the first few I'm going to share a little bit more with you to tell you a little bit more about some of these interventions. Um, I'm really glad to share these with you um, in electronic versions and paper versions if this is something you want to learn about. But I also want you to consider these for yourselves. These are not just great for patients, but these are great stress management strategies and positive affect building and resilience strategies for busy professionals. So let's talk about a few of these. So the first is pleasant activity scheduling. This is part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is the part we can always get our patients to do because it's fun. Um, what we tell patients is uh, three to five days a week, set aside time to do something that you really enjoy. Put it on your calendar, put it on your iPhone, treat it at, with the same respect as you would a doctor's appointment or some other non-miss appointment. You can pick simple things like having a cup of coffee with a friend or taking the dog for a walk 
But we encourage people to spend time doing your hobby or your sport or take up a cooking class or a yoga class or binge watch a show, but do something that you enjoy. Often when patients are sick, they do only the things that they have to do and they give up the things that mean the most in their lives, their valued life's activities. So pleasant activity scheduling gets people doing a little bit more of this. Another thing, and actually my students, I teach undergrads too, they say this is it. This is the most life-changing thing that they do during the time that we have together. It's keeping a gratitude diary. Has anybody done that? Has anybody done this before? Yeah, some show of hands. It can be really, really powerful. The way that we tell people to do this is write down three things every evening for which you are grateful. Kind of think through the day what was meaningful to you and write these things down. Make a commitment to do it every single day, every single night for a 30-day period or however long you want to do it. But these three things must be different every day. So by about day seven, you are really looking for things to be grateful for, right? <laughs> You've already covered the kids, the family, the dog, the job, your job. And you start really looking at and appreciating the little things, the sunset, a raindrop, a flower, a hug from a friend, right? These are the things that really enrich your life when you're aware of them. When, you're be, when you stop scanning for the tigers and start looking at the waterfalls, becoming more aware of the beautiful things out there, Another really cool thing is uh, signature, signature strengths. Identify what someone's signature strengths are. We all have them. There's many of them. There are a series of six virtues in the, in the, in the navy blue and a whole bunch of little strengths off to the right here. Again, I'm glad to share my, um, my uh, slides with you if you want to see. And what we do is we encourage people to identify their signature strengths by completing a questionnaire or in a website. I'm going to show you in a sec so you guys can do this too. But we tell them to identify their signature strengths and use these strengths, at least the top seven of them, in different ways. Right? So if one of your strengths is creativity and you're typically a pretty artistic, use it in a new way. How would you use creativity in the ORs? Right? So how do you use these things that are inherent in you and make you strong in new ways to make you even more powerful? And this is the cool website where you can actually get your strengths done. Um, this is a nonprofit organization that allows you to log in here. They do keep all your data and they, I don't know what all they do with it, but basically <laughs> they do report um, regularly about the different character strengths across the world. This is a worldwide effort to understand more about, you know, do people in Czechoslovakia have, been, you know, have value the same character strengths we do here? But it'll spit out a report for you and it'll tell you what your strengths are and also what your non-strengths are. So it's, also, it's a really kind of neat thing to know. We encourage our patients to become more mindful. And a great way to teach mindfulness is through savoring. Again, those of us who are busy eat our meals probably like this and run. One of the best ways to learn savoring is just to eat something really slowly, a piece of chocolate, really enjoy it, have a sense of it. And what we tell people is to consider a typical weekday. Review your morning routine, your daily activities, and your evening rituals, and consider how much time you spend noticing and enjoying the pleasures of the day, both small and large. Every day for the next week, make sure you savor at least two experiences. For example, savor your morning coffee or the sun on your face as you walk to your car. Spend at least two or three minutes savoring an experience. And I challenge all of you, at some point today, just savor something. And if it's really, really special to you, tell yourself, take a mind picture. If you mindfully say, remember this moment and remember what you smell, what you feel, who you're with, what you feel like, that memory will stick with you. The more of these positive memories we can load away, the more it tends to color our mood, just like traumatic memories tend to color our mood in negative ways. Another great thing to do, another one that's fun to do, scatter out, acts of kindness. Spend one day doing five acts of kindness. Somehow this is the magic combination. We've been studying this for years, but doing five intentional acts of kindness in one day, they can be really small things or big things. Don't expect anything from the person. Often people will look at you weird. If you buy somebody a, a cup of coffee behind you at Starbucks, they're often a little shocky and trying to figure out why you're being so creepy. But often a few minutes later, they think, oh my gosh, that was so cool. And frequently they'll buy the person behind them a cup of coffee, right? So kindness has a way of spreading like a ripple. So the more we put out there, uh, the more we get back. But who benefits? is the giver of kindness. We're the ones that physiologically and psychologically benefit so greatly from doing kind acts. And I'm going to conclude by telling you about a couple of things that we have ongoing. Um, 
I've developed an intervention that was kind of a child of need. The thought was like, can we develop an intervention that we could do maybe surgically or for patients undergoing medical procedures, but no psychologists. We don't want any people involved, you know, so something we can just give them. Um, something that, you know, will teach them to be positive and look at positive things and something that's fun and easy so we don't freak them out and uh, some way that they'll remember to do this. And so we put our heads together and we came up with this thing called the positive piggy bank. And so what we do is we start off with our patients. They, we have a bunch of pigs. I mean, we literally have like 50 pigs. And we tell the patient, pick a pig. And they get a pig, piggy bank, and they get a little card that is um, laminated. They get a bunch of little pieces of paper. And what it says on the laminated card is, every evening think about the people, things, or events that made you happy that day. You may make a list if you like. Pick one of these and spend a moment savoring it. What made it so special to you? Now write down this moment on a currency slip, a little piece of paper. Use enough detail that you can immediately recall what happened. Next, add a date, fold up your happy memory currency and drop it into the piggy bank. You will make these happy memory deposits in the same manner every evening for the next 30 days. And then we eventually tell them at the end of 30 days, you'll close your account. This means that you will withdraw all the currency from your piggy bank and read each and every one of these depositive happy memory slips. As you read them, try and recall the details of the happy event and what made it so special to you and enjoy. So what we do is we've been testing this in healthy, happy people to see if it makes them happier. We've uh, tested in breast cancer, which I'm going to tell you about, and we're testing, we're just getting the results in a spine pain cohort. And what we're seeing so far are some effects for lowering negative affect, depression and anxiety. We're seeing lower levels of fatigue, hints about lower pain, improved subjective well-being, and significant life satisfaction improvement. So the little mini pilot that we did in a, on the surgical setting was in women undergoing breast cancer surgery. Um, these women were 18 and older, English speaking, gave consent, and we did a bunch of questionnaires and then we randomized them to do the piggy bank thing, just 10 patients and 10 patients not. And then we did questionnaires afterwards and then we did questionnaires again at 14 days just to see if this was agreeable, if we could see any signal. And sure enough, um, with this particular intervention, we called them the night before surgery and said, okay, open up your piggy bank. And so they opened the piggy bank and what we saw was pretty cool. The red line is the control group, the blue line is the, uh, is the intervention group. Uh, one is baseline, two is the morning of surgery. And we see negative affect, you know, this is depression and anxiety, anxiety day, greatly decreased in the piggy bank group. And at 14 days, it, the decrease kind of stayed there nicely. And then we saw a really nice decrease in fatigue, which is interesting. But it makes sense to us because positive activities are activating. They tend to make people just do stuff. So that was kind of exciting. And then lastly, we're really kind of having fun too with virtual reality environment. I'm working with um, Melissa Bauer, Bauer and um, some other phenomenal folks within the University of Michigan Department of Anesthesiology. And we tested uh, this underwater virtuality, uh, virtual reality experience in women who were um, first, first baby, laboring without um, anesthesia, and who were willing to try anything. And so <laughs> we had them kind of alternate using the goggles, not using the goggles. This is a kind of a randomized uh, crossover study. But what we found is that, first of all, we, were, we thought they'd get really nauseous. They didn't, so they did well. And uh, they said it, and it did not interfere with the birthing experience. It was great. And they had upwards of 40% reduction in pain. These are very immersive experiences. And 201, they said, you know what, you need to get this really specific for birth. That'd be really cool if it kind of was directed towards us. But So that's kind of some fun things that we can see being um, applied to use resilience and positive activities um, in the perioperative setting. So just to kind of summarize, um, it's really important that we identify patients at risk for poor surgical outcomes and, and of course uh, increased opioid use. What we know about this is it tends to be patients who are more depressive and anxious, uh, who catastrophize their pain, um, but often people who have high levels of preoperative pain, a traumatic surgical history, and low social support are all big predictors of who might uh, have a prob problematic outcome. And then the goal is to perhaps identify some of these folks and tailor treatment. We could use prehab interventions, everything from sophisticated things like M-Shop or to these more primitive, simple, 
paper and piggy bank types of things, um, relaxation techniques, virtual reality, um, teaching pain coping skills, and even social support, even minor things like creating even a surgery guide, somebody who literally walks through the process with patients, because patients often feel like they don't really know what's going on next, and that can be really uh, unsettling. So. So those are my thoughts, and these are the wonderful people with whom I work, and not a complete list, um, and then some of the uh, sponsors of our, of, our, of our research. So thank you. I have to push a button, okay. I can figure this out. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions, so feel free to ask questions of any of the speakers up here. Um, there's two mics in the center, so please um, approach the mic microphone when you ask your question. Thanks so much for a really, uh, hmm. did I, oh, there it is. Thanks so much for a really fascinating panel. Um, it's so exciting to hear about this um, problem we sort of find ourselves in as a specialty from so many different angles. Um, I was I was struck by um, a hint of uh, sex dimorphism in the response to um, the interventions that you were showing, and I was wondering if um, you could comment a little bit on the method, the um, mechanisms that are hypothesized there, and then um, Dr. Hassett and Dr. Walji, if you could comment on how that potential for a gender specific effect impacts the way that you've explored your own data about um, opioid use and about resilience and positivity. Hello. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, so, um, yes, uh, in, in our study, unfortunately, it was just a hint. We didn't see any, uh, any significant differences between um, males and females, and that's probably one of the caveats of this um, uh, surgical model in, in, in rodents. Um, there have been other studies in, in, um, in rats and mice, and they show exactly the same thing, basically no difference, even with uh, greater numbers um, than uh, the ones we used in, in, in our study. Um, so in terms of uh, differences, there are, um, in, in, in humans, uh, uh, th they are very clear, and, and I will let the rest of the, the panelists um, uh, take over and, 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 and respond to your question, but um, there is a clear implication of uh, sex hormones uh, in, 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 the, in pain responses in, in females relative to, to males. Um, Generally, we haven't seen too many differences um, amongst, you know, within our data, other than women really seem to love these interventions, and men pretend like they don't, but they do. <laughs> Once they do, then they seem to benefit most, and, and even within the piggy bank, the men are almost the most excited because they pick the piggy bank for a kid or <laughs> for someone else. So, yeah, so, so yeah, we, we, we certainly consider that. We're, we're doing a large R01 right now looking at uh, a, a very organized version of these of these interventions, and we will definitely look at the difference between sexes, because the NIH said we had to. <laughs> yeah, okay, what my uh, fellow uh, panelists said, um, we haven't seen huge effects with respect to new persistent use and some of the other things. I don't know if that's because we were using insurance claims data, which is relatively blunt. Um, and so in some of our upcoming work, we are doing more prospective work around um, anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation is in there, centralized pain syndromes, and seeing if that predicts um, some of the opioid consumption and um, opioid use disorders that we see after surgery. Um, and there may be gender differences there that we just haven't seen yet in claims because it's not sensitive enough for it. I was just curious, um, on the study uh, where with sleep deprivation and then uh, giving caffeine, um, have you tried to, my understanding is that you were giving caffeine before the sleep deprivation. Have you guys tried to sleep deprive, then give caffeine and see what happens? Um. We didn't do it, um, but uh, that is part of our plan, and we are trying to figure out whether to incorporate. Uh, we, obviously, um, after having done this study, one of the, the problems is the one you pointed out, and um, we have plans to, to address that, but we are now at a moment where we have to decide whether to uh, continue testing these things in, in 
rodents or taking that into uh, patients. Um, so as soon as we have that figured out, um, we will uh, determine what is the best timing for caffeine administration. And so there are many other questions like, uh, are um, chronic caffeine users as responsive as uh, non-users? Um, what happens with uh, chronic sleep deprivation? It's a different animal, acute versus chronic sleep deprivation. So there may be many factors uh, that we have to take into, into consideration in, in order to um, get a more um, translationally valid um, uh, response from our, from our um, preclinical studies. Thank you all for a great panel. And um, actually, and I was in particular interested um, about the targeting. You know, it seems that we're entering this era where everybody gets the same thing, or we have protocol, very protocolized medicine. And I think it, I think it makes sense to personalize medicine and, and adapt or pick, you know, strategies that are going to work for certain people. And I was interested in how you, for your big studies that you're going to be doing, how you set the cutoff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because probably an, anyone could benefit, but like at some point you say, okay, now this person's going to benefit enough, so we're going to give the intervention to them. Because it seems like it's sort of tricky. It's like a slippery slope. No, it's a great question. It's actually something that uh, Jen and I are talking about putting in an R01 uh, in October, and we've been kind of wrestling with this too. How do we um, allow people to kind of pick? You know, I, I think there's a, a lot of natural inclination towards one type of intervention versus another. Sounds like it's just ridiculous. They wouldn't benefit. So I, I, I think that's more of, of the of the trend is to kind of offer them to people, or you know, kind of as as here are four offerings. What seems to be the thing that you like the best? Because I think people tend to persist and do something that they feel that they've chosen and they value versus something that they're told to do that doesn't make sense to them. Thank you. I don't know if I have the right, I'll just speak up. John Carlo, you, you gave the rats caffeine so they could get a better night's sleep. I'm just, <laughs> are they different than us? I mean, I, I, didn't they, does it make them sleep or allow them to sleep? Um. <laughs> well, um, no. <laughs> this was um, just a uh, a treatment option to counteract uh, sleep debt in, in, in these animals. Uh, of course, the best choice is to um, put more emphasis on natural sleep. I mean, it's <laughs> non-GMO, natural, cheap, <laughs> you know, <laughs> all those things. Um, so <laughs> the idea is to make uh, the patients sleep better. And, and um, I, I omitted to mention um, that uh, the importance of, of uh, this uh, study, um, or how this study fits well into the reality of, of patients, is that um, you see patients that drive from many parts of Michigan um, from far away in the morning prior to surgery. Um, good luck getting good sleep when you get the call. You know, uh, we, we need you by tomorrow, um, and you will have surgery. Um, so. That, in addition to uh, um, epidemiological data showing that, um, at least in North America, one uh, every three adults are sleep deprived, uh, I, I think makes a, a good case for this. But uh, um, the option, the first option is always try to make the sleep better without this uh, uh, intervention. In, in our case, we saw some. Um, hyperactive rats after caffeine injection for a few hours and then they crashed and <laughs> supposedly they had um, more sleep. That's something that we have to look into and uh, determine whether, one of the questions is whether um, these animals did a lot better in terms of their post-op uh, pain because uh, of caffeine or because after that hyper time they went to sleep and they have deeper sleep uh, before surgery. So that's, uh, thank you. Dr. Wachi, oh, sorry, golly. You can ask a question. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So you're, you're going back and forth about uh, rodents versus uh, going into humans. I would definitely say 
go into humans. There's pro probably no population more sleep deprived, uh, acutely at least, than a, a preoperative surgical population yeah. of it. Uh, so a, a question I had for the panel, I wanted to take this back just a little bit to um, the, the scholars focus um, on, on people, on our, uh, our, our audience developing um, academic and research careers. And um, when I think about perioperative pain management in opioids, I think we've, as this panel has demonstrated very well, it's, it's not just an anesthesiologist's problem. It's clearly there's a benefit to a wide range of disciplines uh, approaching this problem. And so th that um, makes me realize that, sure, the, the thing that we need to do with, uh, with really approaching any problem, you know, it doesn't have to be perioperative pain, um, is to facilitate uh, multidisciplinary collaboration, and so I just I was wondering if each of you could speak just briefly about h how you've been actually able to do how have you been able to do that? What what forums and what opportunities have you had where you've actually been able to bridge that gap um, from um, you know it could be within the medical school or it could be to a, an, another discipline outside the medical school altogether? What what have been some of the um, critical interactions that you've had that have brought on a completely different viewpoint of your of the problem that you're approaching, and um, and the benefit that you got out of that? Sure, I can start. I think um, Afton made a great point that um, kind of talking about your interests and having your elevator pitch um, well honed so that when you interact with all these different people, if it's in the operating room or the hallways or a lecture series, um, you're ready to go with kind of, you know, here's my 30 second spiel. Um, and that really allows you to um, find connections quickly, which has been um, a great opportunity for us. Um, I will say, so within, um, at Michigan, um, I'm under a different uh, section than Mike, who's in transplant surgery. I'm under plastic surgery, and then um, the, and then there's the Department of Anesthesia. And so sometimes at large um, universities, you know, administratively and academically, um, you know, team science gets hard when it comes to you know, well, how is this person going to navigate through the system, and who's going to sit at this cubicle, and all those kinds of things. So I think that. Um, the you know trust and open communication has been fantastic, and just kind of remembering the um, that the value is in the partnership, um, and the people that you get to work with are the ones that are going to help us do the important work. So um, being you know mindful about staying on you know the um, good work that we get to do is probably key, so that that way all those like a little administrative bumps in the road um, don't create you know roadblocks that prevent you from working together. And, uh, that's great. I just want to add one thing too. Go to stuff. Go to lectures, go to SIGs, go to um, conferences. You're already ahead of the game because you're here, so that's, that's a great step. But it's, that's how you start to meet people, and it seems like once you meet a couple people, these networks almost build themselves. But it's usually just taking those first steps, so kind of the combination of having that elevator pitch, knowing what you are interested in what, and, how to, and how to communicate that, and then just kind of showing up and talking to folks. Well, I, I don't have anything meaningful to add, really. Uh, I think you, you, you covered everything. Um, uh, one last thing I would say is um, find good mentors, choose wisely, and that is huge for your careers. As we had heard earlier today uh, in numerous talks about uh, mentorship. So um, if there's uh, no further questions, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists again for such great presentations and uh, give them a round of applause. Thank you.